Lynn Knight is our first feature tonight. She's the author of six full-length poetry collections and six chapbooks. Lynn's work has appeared in many journals, including Poetry and the Southern Review. Her awards and honors include publication in Best American Poetry, a Prix de l'Alliance Française, a PSA Lucille Medwick Memorial Award, a Rattle Poetry Prize, and a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. Lynn lives on Vancouver Island. Please give a warm welcome to Lynn Knight. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Monica and Sandy and um, Shauna for inviting me. And I'm happy to be here virtually back in the Bay Area, which I miss quite a bit. Um, but I love living on Vancouver Island. I thought I would start with an older poem by way of offering a kind of prayer for tomorrow because my feeling has been all along that women are going to save us. The silence of women. Finally, the silence of women began to disappear. It crumbled like old bread. It evaporated like steam from broccoli. It rose like the scent of turmeric from kitchens. It mixed in with birdsong. It flew over rivers and oceans. It settled in prairies. It poured out like water trapped in leaves. The silence was one language. All the women on earth spoke it. They had mastered the tongue but it vanished in the sound of vacuum cleaners. It lifted like smoke from chimneys. In winter, it covered the snow. It was white then, so at first no one noticed. More snow, they thought, longing for spring. When spring came, the silence burst into cherry blossoms, plum blossoms, apple. This world of ours, the women cried and their stories rushed out like breath held almost too long. So the next um, four poems I think that I'm going to read have to do with my childhood in an unfinished house that was seriously unfinished, dirt floor, no rooms in the house, no plumbing to speak of, no heat, um, and that, with the fact that my parents decided to send my sister and me to Catholic school when I was 12, and the, the nuns in the school urging me to convert, to pray for the gift of faith, and my father at home telling me, as the atheist he was, not to listen to them. So the first poem I'm reading has to do with um, repeated uh, efforts, dreams really, to escape the house. And it's called Unheard Murmurs in the Unfinished House. We would live in a country where people read the wrong way, my mother said, from right to left, and where words looked more like drawings than words, and women wore veils to keep their faces hidden and women couldn't drive. So wherever we went, we would walk while my father was working. And it would be hot, hotter than I could imagine. But no, not like the flames of hell. It would be heaven not to have to shiver all through winter. We would cross the ocean by boat. We would live there a year, maybe longer. We might learn to read from right to left and even write the beautiful words that look like drawings. And we would not be allowed to wear dungarees or any pants, long or short. We would need new everything. So we should pray my father passed the physical, because if he did, we would leave as soon as school got out. The ocean would look like rough sky, nothing else in sight, not even a bird. And when we finally arrived, we would hide under our veils. We would be strangers, even to ourselves at first. We would live in a house with doors and windows, 
floors, carpets, closets, plumbing, nothing unfinished or wrong about it. But his heart murmured. You couldn't hear it without a special instrument, but it murmured. And what it kept saying meant no, no, we couldn't go. We were stuck in the unfinished, the undone. So the other complicating fact of my childhood was that my father um, drank. So this is called What You Missed While You Were Home Sleeping Off a Saturday Afternoon Drunk. Aunt Bess, who was nobody's aunt, said the woods were a cathedral. I should bow my head in prayer. I said it was hard to pray while I was walking through the woods. Besides, I said, my father didn't believe in God. Aunt Bess stopped. She told me people who didn't believe in God would go straight to hell when they died. I said my father didn't believe in hell either. He thought all of it was an elaborate scheme to keep control over the masses. Aunt Bess said that was blasphemy. God could strike blasphemers dead right on the spot. I said my father might die from drinking or smoking too much but he swore God would have nothing to do with it. We passed the small waterfall. Aunt Beth said it seemed pure, but it was filled with microbes that could make anyone who drank it deathly ill. Some people might seem pure as the driven snow, she said, but could be filled with evil. Did I understand the comparison? I said the woods were the woods, not a cathedral, and if my father ever found out she'd said he was going straight to hell, he'd laugh. You would have, right? That throaty laugh I loved that came from too much drink and smoke. You'd say not to pay too much heed to a poor old woman who had nothing to love but her cats. You'd say she was already in hell. She just needed company. So because of the nun's efforts to um, convert me, really, and my desire at the time to be admitted into this community, I often um, made up my own sorts of prayers. And this is about one of them. It's called Ersatz Hymns. The bells the priest rang failed to move my heart, which seemed another version of the upstairs door my father had nailed shut, the one intended as the main door, opening to a ramp that stayed, like most things there, within the realm of the imagined. I could imagine faith from all the stories told of all the saints, and like most girls my age, I loved St. Francis, who fed the birds the way Christ fed the multitudes, conversions out of air, the air miraculously seen, or so I dreamed when I walked through the woods and sang long hymns translated from the Latin, in other words, invented out of air, since I knew only hic, hic, hoc, or veni, vidi, vici, neither of which seemed apt to provoke the religious ecstasy I knew would come if only my stubborn heart would open its door, my obstinate, mulish, adamantine heart, words I memorized from barons as I built the house my father said would outlast any house as long as I drew breath, a house of words. The girls I studied with believed that Christ came near whenever those bells rang, so they knelt penitent for sins they often couldn't even name. And later in the woods, I sang and sang while birds seemed to respond. Although if I stood still, none flitted to my shoulders and the silence all around me seemed a metaphor for all my absence. So this is the last one from that chapbook that I'm working on um, that I'm going to read. It's called Waiting for Illumination. 
I longed for the lush rush of penitence that shattered poor Saul on his way to Damascus. I pored over lives of saints, the more well-known or the forgotten with names too hard to pronounce, lays for throat ailments, him writing Columna, the patron of poets. But faith kept eluding me. The nun said I needed humility, so I imagined hair shirts, flagellation, extremities topple both kingdoms and kings, swore my father. This strange dialogue aired constantly on my interior channel. No arguing with God, said the nuns. Stop swallowing all their malarkey, said my father. When Sister Eusebio showed us Caravaggio's great painting of the terrified horse and the awe-stricken men, Paul shielding his eyes from the penetrant light, I could hear all their screaming and feel all the sweat from the horse's great flanks and the men's worn garments. But at home, bow as I would, shield my eyes as Paul did, the only light came from the rickety table lamp or my father striking a match. So now I'm shifting into some poems um, from a manuscript that I'm revising and revising and revising. I thought I had it finished a couple of months ago, but no, it's not ready. Um, this is the, one of the poems in it called Elegy with Peach and Toe. They say the dead don't speak. Don't believe it. Just this morning I opened my mouth and my mother began to talk in the most natural way about the problems that can come with buying peaches a little too ripe. They bruise on the way home, she said. So there you are, facing another peach cobbler. And who needs another peach cobbler? That was my mother's shorthand for the deadly repetitiveness of things. Deadly was a word we used freely then, before the dead began to surround us. Her father, her mother, my father. My sister and I used to pray our father would die first because if our mother died, we said, he'd drink himself to death. He'd already tried several times. So there I was, slicing a bruised peach, my mother nine years dead, my father so many more that I almost never opened my mouth and heard his throaty laugh, his smoke-coated words. He was more apt to emerge through the hand. The dead can't write, they say, but don't believe that either. My father's there in my signature. This happens slowly, like my face beginning to be old. A slant, a narrowing of the loops, a blur from one letter to the next. Don't get me wrong. I'm not one of those women locked into mourning. I was just slicing a peach for my cereal, and there the dead were again. The toey on the bank knew nothing of this as it pecked at seed fallen from the feeder with deadly repetitiveness, so to speak. This is a poem for my sister who lives in Vermont and whose house I love because it looks out at the Green Mountains. And um, I especially loved going there in summer because my sister is a wonderful gardener and her yard is filled with gorgeous flower beds. And at night in the summer, fireflies, which I miss, really miss um, living on the West Coast. This is called The Remedy. The last night of my visit, we waited past dark to eat. The July heat still hadn't settled back into the fields, so we left the dishes for later and walked the dirt road up the mountain, past the last of the lived-in houses, 
into the noise of peepers and owls. It had been a hard year for my sister, and all week we'd been telling bitter stories, inventing even bitterer details, a remedy we'd learned as girls. A few stories had ironies so severe we laughed until we snorted and weakened with relief. There was little risk in walking the mountain that late. The road was seldom traveled after dark. Still, we talked low if we talked at all. An owl and peepers loud and steady. Enough moon to whiten the abandoned house at the top where we turned back. By then, I could hear my sister sighing the way she does when the unsayable lodges in her throat. I wanted to say something about the dark, how it's quicker when you're headed down into it, something to let her know I knew the bitter stories hadn't helped. But we were almost to the houses, walking quickly to the tasks ahead, so quickly we almost missed the field seeping for miles toward mountains that were more of the field's black, black space glittering with fireflies, so that for one giddy moment, the world turned upside down, the sky suddenly ours to walk through, unimpeded. We plunged in, heedless of rocks or hollows, the grass at our legs, of everything but space, more space, and the stars right there at our fingers. And the last poem I'll read is called The Warm Bed. We decided not to think about being as old as we were, fearing we'd soon feel feeble, far removed from our youthful vision of ourselves as old ladies in flowered dresses on the veranda, drinking afternoon tea while eating sweets, because who cared how fat we got? And besides, the dresses, capacious, fluttery as butterfly wings. But no, forget that. We wanted to look younger than we were, not with the aid of dyes or face work, just our attitude, which, face it, hadn't always been great, resenting those who were more this or more that, before being chastened into gratitude over the years as the end neared, that death we didn't want to think about the way we had when we were young, oh, tender angst. By now we knew that lying on our deathbed, regretting time wasted, was probably inevitable. But why make it worse than it had to be? Why waste more time than we already had, dreaming ourselves into other lives, other places, when each day waited like a lover who knew our flaws, yet called to us anyway from the warm bed? Thanks very much.